this lecture, we're going to consider the difference between conscious and unconscious mental states with respect to perception. And that's uh, often called subliminal perception, if you're talking about unconscious perception. This is what we're going to do over the course of the next uh, two weeks. We'll spend two weeks talking about subliminal perception, which is one, it's one of the biggest areas uh, within uh, the investigation of unconscious processes. First of all, looking at um, some terms, because when you read, read up in papers, you might come across some technical terms which aren't defined. So let me just <coughs> go through those terms so you're clear about what you're reading in uh, procedure sections. One definition you could have of subliminal perception is perceiving without being aware of perceiving. And uh, we'll think about it a little later if that's the best way of thinking about it. Obviously, that's a, a higher order thought way of thinking about what uh, unconscious perception might be. Now, for some decades, when you talk about something more perception, what you would expect to get in a paper uh, is probably a type of masking procedure, which I'll go through. So what's illustrated here is uh, what's displayed over time. And in the middle here is a stimulus word or a picture that you want to make subliminal. So how do you make this subliminal? You present another stimulus either directly afterwards or directly before it or both. Uh, and that's the mask. Uh, if you present the mask afterwards, it's called the back of mask, as it were, the mask can put actions acting backwards on the stimulus block is conscious perception paper. And uh, if you present the mask beforehand, uh, the mask in action, as it were, is acting forwards on the stimulus, so it's called the forward mask. The backward mask is most effective, so that's what's typically used. Although often, as you will see, both a forward and a backward mask are used. The time from the, the offset of one stimulus to the onset of the next is called the interstimulus interval, or ISI, interstimulus interval. And that, in many cases, is zero. And the ISI turns out not to be the really relevant timing variable. So what's normally talked about is the SOA stimulus onset asynchrony, which is the time from the beginning of one stimulus to the beginning of the next. And uh, it's that parameter that turns out to be most important for determining the effectiveness of a uh, backward mask. So I just go through all of that and you, you have it there to look at, because the paper might just say the SOA was this, so we varied the SOA. Uh, and maybe you'll have no sense of what they're talking about. But what they're, they're talking about is the uh, time from the start of the stimulus you, you want to mask to the start of the mask. And we'll see later in the lecture uh, what happens when you vary this away. A monoptic mask is presented to the same eye as the stimulus that you're masking. But, but something else you can do if you have the equipment to present separately to, to each eye um, is a, a dichoptic mask, which is when you present the, the, uh, the target to one eye and the mask to the other eye. And what that ensures is the masking effect isn't at the retinal level, but has to occur more centrally. Whereas if you had a monoptic mask, you could be getting masking effects happening retinally. And uh, obviously if, you, if you're interfering with the retinal processing, you couldn't expect to get unconscious processing of meaning. You would need the, the target stimulus to be processed somewhere centrally and then interrupted if you want to hope to get some perception. Now, there are different sorts of masks. Uh, a noise mask is um, where the mask just consists of each pixel being randomly on or off. It 
it's white noise. So you know, probably know white noise in the auditory case. Well, that's the visual equivalent of that, which is what you get if you look at an untuned TV screen. That's white noise. So you can, you can mask with uh, white noise. But that only works monoptically, not dichoptically. So it's a, a, a retinal level masking effect. And um, it doesn't lead to subliminal perception. If you, if you mask with a, a noise mask, you just see, you wipe out perception. If it's an effective mask, you just stop the processing. So nothing especially interesting. More interesting is a pattern mask, which is when you mask with the uh, same sort of stimulus as the target itself. Or a sort of a degraded version of it, but one in which it still constitutes the same sort of patterns of structures. So if you're uh, trying to mask the processing of a word, a pattern mask could just be a set of letters. Could be another word, or it could just be XXX. That constitutes a pattern mask. Or if it's faces, you present a face, you could have a scrambled face as a pattern mask. Or maybe just another face. Pattern mask you can present to both eyes or dichotomy just to one eye, and that works well. And it's with the pattern masking that you get, as we see, subliminal perception. Now, one different sort of mask, somewhat similar to the pattern masking that is structured, that operates in a different way, and we'll be looking at this later, is a, is a meta contrast. In this case, what you have is you, the mass stimulus um, goes around the stimulus. It, with a pattern mask, you had, the, say, the face there and then another face on top of it, overlapping the stimulus. This one sort of encircles the stimulus. So you see here that this square and this diamond actually fit inside the mask, fit inside the space. So this is what the subject would actually see. You see a square of a diamond, and then see this. <coughs> and the stimuli actually fit inside the axis. That's a meta-contrast mask. I know it sounds slightly funny, but we'll see it has some interesting and useful properties, different from pattern masking, which we're going to use later to uh, argue some theoretical points about what's going on. For some decades, uh, pattern masking was maybe a bit of meta contrast masking was the, the uh, technique just used in all the studies. But in the last uh, several years, some new techniques have been invented uh, for making material subliminal, visual material subliminal, and um, they have been extremely useful. So that's, that's the first, the first one relies on a phenomenon called binocular rivalry. <coughs> this occurs if you present to one eye one stimulus, say here in the face, and another eye another stimulus, say a house. Now the brain isn't used to this because normally what you'll get is extremely similar images in each eye, right? Just ever so slightly displaced. It doesn't have that displacement can be used to work out depth. So the, the brain is used to coordinating two images which are extremely similar to each other. So what does it do when it gets completely different images in each eye? Um, you don't see a sort of an unholy mixture of the two. What tends to happen is uh, most of the time you're seeing one or the other. So you get a clear percept of say a face maybe last five seconds, however long it is. And then it, then you get this um, sort of uh, breaking down, this sort of unholy mixing happening just for a bit in the switching phase, uh, as if the house is breaking through, coming out, and there's the house. And now you have a clear percept of a house. So the brain alternates between 
the, the two perceptions. Maybe half a dozen seconds each, depending on the individual differences in there. So that's by not the rivalry. It's like each, um, each image is, is fighting to take control of your conscious perception. Well, this was used by now to cheer and uh, his supervisor Coke to come up with a technique called continuous flash suppression, or CFS, which has been much used ever since. <coughs> so the idea here is we'll use this rivalry phenomenon, but we'll make one of the images um, with lots of color, random motion, so that it dominates, and that's all you consciously see because it has lots of uh, variety of movements of color and so on. In the other eye, you present the stimulus you want to be subliminal, say in this case, a stationary face. And what you get here, and you can sustain for a very long time, is um, just this uh, pattern, as we consciously see. So now what you can do is, is to sustain an image that's been processed in the brain somewhere, but it's not consciously experienced at all for long periods of time, which is an advantage on the back masking, because as we'll see, when you, when you do the back masking, you have to flash the uh, target stimulus for a sufficiently short period of time, maybe only 30 milliseconds. For 30 milliseconds, what sort of processing could you expect? Maybe not much anyway, just because of the time scale involved. But here we can present the subliminal material for a long time, in the order of seconds, as long as we wish. So maybe we could get different sorts of effects. And uh, here, Ryan Scott at Sussex has programmed up uh, CFS, it's a technique that we use at Sussex. Meanwhile, in uh, Paris, in Sid Coudet's lab, um, Nathan Trevor, Bote Coudet, uh, developed another sort of technique for maintaining material at a subliminal level for long periods of time. And again, Ryan has programmed this up. The idea here is that, um, uh, let's say, the subject focuses on a fixation cross, and then you present the face, or any stimulus, whatever it is in this case, it's, it's a face that you want to make subliminal, unseen. In this particular experiment, which we'll uh, look at later, uh, the interest was in the emotion of the face, whether a subliminal emotional face could drive and feel about the stimulus. It's transparent. Now, the face or the stimulus you want to be made uh, subliminal is surrounded by masks, so it becomes naturally masked. Which, this is where the crowding comes from, it's crowded out. So the, as long as the person keeps looking at the cross there, they don't see that face. It's, it's crowded out or actually masked by the, by the stimulus around them. Now all the person would have to do is to look at the face and they'll see it clearly. So, the, so what was the uh, clever thing about this paradigm is it uh, uses an eye tracker. And as soon as the pers person is told to keep looking, at the cross. As long as they look at the cross, you can set it up um, in a um, sort of a, a threshold phase, setting up phase, so that they don't see what, what the face is, so they don't, they don't see the subliminal stimulus. Now, if their eyes leave the cross and go to the stimulus, the device tells that their eyes have moved, takes the stimulus away. So as soon as you look at it, it's gone. So that way you can't cheat the system, is it? So that way you can, um, with safety, hold the face there as long as you want, keep it subliminal, knowing the person can't look at it, because as soon as they do, you've detected it and, and, and uh, 
computers made the stimulus go away. So that's a gaze contingent crowding, and that's another method which works by different visual physiological principles in terms of keeping uh, the, the stimulus consciously on set. I say made it disappear, gaze contingent substitution. You see, you can swap, swap the um, emotional face for the neutral face. So as soon as you look at it, maybe it doesn't disappear, you see a neutral face. You don't know what emotion uh, the face was showing. So that's the uh, introduction to the terms and the techniques that we're going to use for much of the rest of the, uh, the lectures on spin perception. Now we're going to turn to the notion of thresholds, or the idea of um, how do you decide whether a stimulus is subliminal or not. And we will start by looking at the experiments by Tony Marcel, which really began the rigorous <coughs> investigation of subliminal perception. Subliminal perception had been investigated in experimental psychology really as soon as the field started. So the original experiments within the field of experimental psychology in the 1800s, uh, some of those were about subliminal perception. And that carried on uh, right through the 20th century, mainly uh, motivated by Freudian type ideas. A lot of those experiments were very poorly controlled, uh, had sort of obvious problems, and were not taken seriously. And it was Tony Marcel who turned the field round, uh, who really stirred up interest, and um, is sort of the grandfather of the field of perception and it's conscious versus unconscious uh, mental processes as, it, as rigorously investigated by experimental psychologists. This work was done while Tony was at Sussex and in fact these were student projects run in the 1970s. In those days uh, laptop computers weren't used. These days just for ease you program up a, a computer to display things something like in those days, when experimental psychologists wanted to run an experiment, you'd get a lab to build you equipment. And they built something called a tachistoscope, or a T-scope for short, which used camera shutters, and you had slots to put in cards for the stimulus, um, and a turning device that would move the cards around to put them where you want. Now, that was all quite elaborate, but in fact, I think, much better control than we now have with computers. Because with the camera shutters, you had millisecond accuracy in terms of what you were displaying. Whereas the refresh rate of a screen here, typical computer screen, is 16 milliseconds. That means you can't really control what's being displayed to more than an accuracy of 60 milliseconds. In those days, Tony was doing, you had one millisecond accuracy because you had specially built a tachistoscope. But we still have Tony's tachistoscope in a cupboard somewhere. Perhaps should be brushed off. Um, and Peter Nash, who's associated with Sussex, is uh, building a tachistoscope to see if we can replicate some experiments with computers and T-scopes to see if it does make a difference or it doesn't. In any case, um, here's an example of uh, uh, one of Tony Marcel's early experiments. I'll take you through. And then we'll go through criticism of it. And then we'll see how that criticism turns into some uh, interesting theory about uh, what's going on. So the logic of this is to make use of a phenomenon called uh, semantic priming. That if you show someone a word like nurse, they don't have to do anything with it, they just see nurse. Then there's, for a period of time, they'll be faster to respond to related words, say, in this case, doctor. It doesn't really matter so much what the task is. So in this case, it was an arbitrary task with a, a lexical decision task. We just have to decide whether the, the letters in the order presented make up a word. 
So if you see doctor, you say yes, that's a word. If you saw lick, you'd say no, that's not a word. That's all the subject has to do. Now it's known that if you present a word like nurse, that it's consciousness sitting. <coughs> Somebody just can't do anything. And then the second word doctor comes up, and you make a lesson decision, word yes or no. That you're faster to say yes to doctor if it was preceded by nurse, by bread. In other words, we get priming, semantic or meaning priming from nurse to doctor. So the question is, what would happen if we presented the prime subliminally? Would we still get semantic? How are, we going to, how are we going to determine if the word is subliminal? Well, in the initial threshold setting phase, the, the SOA, stimulus on set asynchrony, between the word and the mask is adjusted in blocks, and the subject had to say whether there was a word before the mask or not, presence or absence judgment. Was something presented before the mask or not? that SOA was shortened until the subject was less than 60% accurate at saying <coughs> present or absent. Does anyone know why less than 60%? Does that sound like a funny? So you can reduce the mask, the SOA, until the subjects in that, in that block is less than 60% correct, saying presence absent. Was there a word there or not? Half the trials there's a word, half the trials there isn't. So 50% would be chance. So he's reducing the SOA until people are less than 60%. Could you have done it? Could you reduce the SOA until people were less than 50% right? Would that be better? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You wouldn't. If people were at chance, they wouldn't be less than 50%. If they were less than 50%, that actually implies something subliminal going on, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it can't really be less than 50%. You could say, why don't you reduce until it is 50%? Remember, um, even if people knew nothing and were guessing, would they perform at exactly 50% in any given block? No. If you flip a coin 10 times, you're not going to get exactly five heads, are you? Every 10 flips. You might get six heads, you might get four heads. <coughs> So what the 60% was, was for the number of trials that he used, it wasn't significantly different from 50%. That's why it's 60%. So it's within the um, margin of error for chance, if you like. It doesn't mean they were at chance, and this is a big problem, which we're going to come, come to later. It just means he's got no evidence they were different from chance. That's the sort of logic a lot of scientists have been using, not just in this field, but they say, if I've got no evidence for an effect, I'll declare no effect. That's completely um, irrational, illogical. So that's why I'm in the business of Bayesian statistics, some of you know, to sort that out. But that is the statistics you've been treated within medicine, neuroscience, psychology. That's the logic you've been subjected to. So that, and that is the logic that's been So you have an initial uh, threshold setting phase where you reduce the SOA into the person's non-significantly different from chance, say present absent. So you say, okay, I've got no evidence that they can say whether a word there is not. So I'll say they can't tell whether the word there is there or not, so therefore it's subliminal. And then he uses that SOA now, after the word to present a mask, and then you make the next decision. 
for the, for the second word. Everyone with me? Here's the reaction times for the unassociated associated word. I mean, I put down there nurse, bread, doctor. Those are just examples. <coughs> lots and lots of different words that get averaged together to make this. When it's unmasked, it's conscious. And people are faster to make the lexical substitution than the target word. <coughs> associated rather than unassociated. 62 milliseconds of precipitation. So that's the priming effect. The faster following semantically related prime in an unrelated prime. You see here for noise masking, as I said, um, no significant priming. And, and in fact, as I said, noise masking doesn't seem to, it just seems to mask in the story. It stops all the process. Now, the dichoptic pattern mask, we get uh, numerically very similar levels of priming as in consciousness. So the apparently subliminal stimulus is still producing uh, uh, healthy levels of semantic priming, indicating it was processed uh, and therefore must allow subliminal perception exists. Words can be unconsciously processed for meaning. So there's a whole, whole, a whole range of experiments were done um, and criticised. In fact, some of the criticisms of the experiments I think were unfair because they were already being dealt with within the original experiments if you read them closely enough. For example, some people said the right threshold may drift over the course of experiment as your eyes become light adapted. But Tony Marcel had already built into some of the experiments constant checking of the threshold throughout the experiment. So those, those now uh, sort of relatively old papers of his are still worth reading uh, for an intelligent discussion of what might be going on in something of perception and consideration of methodological issues as well. Now here's one criticism which turns out to be very interesting, although it will start out sounding fairly dry and methodological. So the, the, the subjects in um, Marcel experiments were asked to say, was there a word there or not? Now, you could decide to say, uh, as a subject, you might say, well, I'm only going to say there's a word there if I'm sure there's a word there. Otherwise, I'll say no. In fact, a subject might say no on 100% of the trials. You might say, well, I'm not really sure there's a word there. I'll, I'll say absence. I'll say nothing. There. Now, let's say they said no on 100% of those <coughs> test trials. What percentage correct would they have? Remember, half the trials there was a word, half the trials there wasn't a word. So if you said no 100% of the time, what percentage correct would you have? So there's a word there 50% of the time. You'd be right that 50% of the time, right? You'd be wrong the other 50% of the time. So if you let a subject say no however many times they want, they could be right 50% of the time just because they said no all the time. But does that mean they saw nothing? Does that mean they had no conscious experience of the word being there? Not necessarily. Uh, they might have had some conscious experience, but they were only going to say yes if they were pretty sure. Right. So they score a 50% correct. So it looks like they're performing bang on chance, as if they've got no conscious experience, but they could have had a fair amount of conscious experience. So 
so the, in the um, sort of methodology terms, your tendency to say yes or no is called your bias. So you could have a bias to say yes or no of 100% or 70% or, or whatever. And that's separate from your ability to discriminate, to actually tell apart what was there. Because let's say you force the subject just to say no 50% of the time. Maybe you give them some tokens. Here's some yes tokens, here's some no tokens. Half and half. You can only use those. It might be under those conditions, the subject can get it right 100% of the time. So suddenly you change the bias to 50% and the discrimination performance goes up to 100%. Does that make sense? So we don't, um, we don't know what was happening in the Tony Marcel case with this respect, but it's a possibility. So maybe, Cheeseman and Merkel argued, he hadn't found the actual objective threshold for discrimination. Maybe subjects could discriminate presence and absence perfectly well. For all we know, we don't know that they could, but for all, maybe they could. So to get around this problem, they said, let's go about it a little bit differently. What we'll do is we'll have four color words, red, green, blue, and yellow. Subjects um, will know it's just those four words. And then on an, any given trial, the subject can tell us, was that a red, was it a green, was it a blue, was it a yellow? They tell us which word it was. That sort of takes away the incentive um, to have a bias, really. I mean, subjects could have a bias and say blue all the time, but it's a bit unlikely, right? You don't, you wouldn't really feel the temptation to say blue 100% of the time. You would feel the temptation to use them roughly equally often, which is what subjects do and what you can check. And the other thing about doing it this way, it is a different sort of threshold. Um, if you're not 100% sure what was there, you still have to guess. So if you had some sense that it was the word blue, you would say blue. All it takes is a little bit of a sense that it was the word blue, and you would say the word blue. <coughs> so now what we've done is we've sort of we've, we've highlighted a maybe a somewhat dry methodological problem, but incidentally a. Um, a crucial point for any for any of you for any projects you're doing if you're looking at people's ability to discriminate in any way in perception in memory in anything else bear in mind the difference between bias your tendency to say old or yes or whatever uh, and your actual ability to tell things apart ability to discriminate now we're going to move on to something a bit more interesting on, on the basis of that point. So now what they did was, um, so we have the four colour words, we'll present the word and then a mask, reduce the SOA, and subjects have to say on each trial what the word was. And you reduce the SOA until subjects were <coughs> actually objectively performing a chance. I say objectively performing a chance because we control the bias for So you start with an SOA, people clearly see what the words are, they get, they're getting it right all the time, and reduce the SOA, next block, reduce the SOA, next block, and so on, until people are objectively performing a chance. And then at the end, end of each block, the subjects made another judgment. They judged how well did they think they were doing by giving a, uh, uh, an estimate of the percentage of trials they thought they got right. Now there's four words here. So if you were guessing randomly, if you really knew nothing at all, if, if you really didn't see anything, consciously or unconsciously, and you just guessed a word randomly, what percentage of trials would you get right? So 25% is the bottom of the scale. So if you thought you saw nothing at all, 
you're guessing completely randomly, you get 25%. If you thought, if you're sure you got everything right, you know you got everything right, you give 100%. Or you can give any number in between. So if you thought you saw a little bit, you could give a bit more than 25%. So what we have is a confidence scale that goes from 25%. So now there's two interesting places the SOA can go to. So we, we start with the big, big SOA, subjects getting it right, pretty confident. Juice the SOA. Presumably at some point you reach an SOA where the person says, I'm performing at 25%. That's the confidence rating they're given. They're giving. So what they're saying is, at that point, it subjectively seems to me, I know nothing. I saw nothing. So that's called the subjective threshold. It's the SOA which subjects believe they're performing a chance. They get at the end of the block. Of the same SOA, exactly. So it was 40 trials in the block. At the end of that, they say, how many, what, what proportion of those trials do you think you got correct? Now, there is a bit of a methodological problem there. That, um, that's after one block of 40 trials. It would actually be better to do it after every trial, I think. We'll see that later in an experiment, experiment that does that. But there's potentially another point, which is you reduce the SOA, and this can be a different point, where the subject objectively is performing a chance. It's not just that they believe they're performing at 25%, they really are performing at 25%. And that's called the objective threshold, because they're objectively a chance at that SOA. So now those two concepts, uh, the subject of threshold, the object of threshold, are ones we're going to be coming back to again and again. So we're just going to dwell on this a little bit. What I'd like you to do is to define them and explain what a subject of threshold is and an object of threshold is to the person next to you. So now, what do you think? Um, if we wanted to show subliminal perception, what would be the relevant threshold? What would convincingly show subliminal perception? Do we need to reach the object of threshold, or should we reach the subject of threshold? <coughs> Actually, why don't you just talk about that person next to you? If you wanted to show subliminal perception, plausibly and convincingly, which threshold do you think is relevant for showing them? So the, the object of threshold, as I say, is measuring ability to tell what the world is. The subject of threshold is measuring ability to say what mental state you're in, you're seeing or you're guessing. So now, what, what's the right threshold? So it depends on your theory of consciousness. On a higher order theory, seeing is conscious if you're aware of seeing. So what would be the corresponding threshold for that theory? So object of the subject. Subject in this realm. Because that's what the subject threshold is measuring. It's measuring whether were you aware of seeing. So these, these are the results. What they did was they found the threshold, uh, the subjective and the objective. The first thing they found was the subjective threshold was reached at the higher SOA than the objective threshold. So the, so the two thresholds are different. 
that means there's a, a time window when the person was about uh, actually about two thirds correct, something like something like sixty five percent correct to saying whether it was red, green, blue, or yellow, really pretty good, while claiming they were just guessing, claiming I saw nothing. So maybe that reminds you of the blind side case I was talking about in the first lecture. Sometimes they saw, they must have seen, getting it right. They can tell what's in the world. At least they're discriminating what's in the world. But they believe they're not seeing. They're seeing, they don't, they're not aware of seeing. So this is, by the subject threshold, evidence for subliminal perception. by a higher order thought theory uh, account of what it is to be conscious. After finding the threshold, this is a second phase of the experiment, where words were presented at either the subject threshold, the colour word, or the object threshold. And then there was a colour on the screen at which the subject had to say what the colour was. And then you can look for a stupid fact. You know, if you have a colour word and a colour and you have to say what the colour is, uh, you get uh, affected by what the word is. So if the word is yellow, if the colour is yellow and the word is red, you're slower to say yellow because of the interference. And if the two are the same, uh, you're relatively fast. That's the Stroop effect. So the question was, what they're interested in is, could you get the Stroop effect, the subject of threshold, or could you get the Stroop effect with the object of threshold? You see, if you've got the Stroop effect with the object of threshold, there'll be a way of showing subliminal perception below the object of threshold. It seems they can't discriminate what the word is, but somehow affecting them, because the word is still producing the Stroop effect. That's potential logic. But they didn't find that. Below the object of threshold, they didn't get any significant Stroop. But they did below the subject of threshold. So we have two pieces of evidence for subliminal perception um, with respect to the, to the subject of threshold. One is below the subject of threshold, you're above the object of threshold. When you say you're not seeing anything, you're, you can discriminate what's there. Second, when you say you can't see, the stimulus, it's still giving you Stroop priming. And as we will see, the, the general conclusions from this that it's relatively easy to get priming below a subject of threshold, and relatively difficult below an object of threshold, stands up. But what we'll look at is whether maybe the more sensitive or new methods, we can e even pick up things below an object of threshold. <coughs> So as I said, it's um, easy to get priming evidence of processing below a subject of threshold, difficult below an objective. Actually, Greenwald, in a survey a while ago now, found those, there was a sort of a, a large agreement with that claim. I'm sure there, there still is now. How we interpret that is another matter. And you'll, you'll see that there's a debate between sort of skeptics and believers. And skeptics tend to argue, um, well, what we really want, if we're going to do science, is something objective. So therefore, we want the objective threshold. And it's difficult to get some of the perception of the objective the threshold, therefore it doesn't exist. So skeptics almost universally take Start so it's only the object of threshold that counts. Why not the subject of threshold? Well, that's that could just be biased. You know. who, who knows what people mean when they when they say I was just guessing or uh, concentrating when they say they can see. Uh, that's leaving it up to the subject to decide what, what things mean. 
um, and that's all too sort of personal and sub well, subjective, and um, so we can't trust it. That's a sort of skeptical. Of course, the other side of the scale, uh, of, of, the, of the argument, is to say, well, consciousness is subjective. If you do away with the subjective, you're throwing away the baby with the bathwater, and you no longer be talking about consciousness. It is when it subjectively seems to you that you did not see, that it counts as unconscious seeing. And that's the other side of it. So one way of dealing with that is to say what we need is not just any old subjective measure, because clearly uh, there could be good and bad ways, or rigorous and less rigorous ways of investigating people's subjective experience. If we get really good or valid measures of subjective experience, we'll be on safer ground talking about um, what people's subjective experiences are and whether we've uh, achieved some sort of subjective perception. One particular approach to this was developed by Morton Overgaard. Um, he developed what he called the perceptual awareness scale. He, he argued that confidence scales, or you know, 25% to 100% aren't really natural ways of talking about your experience. So he asked subjects to look at, uh, say, shapes, different uh, visual things he displayed, and to talk about classifying their experiences, really introspect, think about the vividness and clarity of their experience, think about what would be the natural ways of describing those experiences. And as, as a result of going back and forth with subjects a few times, he came up on this scale, which he calls the perceptual awareness scale, uh, which he felt captured in an intuitively natural way people's um, introspective experiences. So you could have, you, you could have masked so well or flashed so quickly, the person just has no experience at all. So that's the first category. In other words, no impression of the stimulus. Or it could be, as we call the a brief glimpse, you know you saw something, but you have no idea what it was. It was just like a flash. So if it was a shape, you would say, I've got no idea what the shape was, but there was something. That would be the next level up in terms of some sort of uh, visual experience you could interest in. Or you'd find that some aspects of that experience were actually vivid. You could make out some aspects of what you were seeing. There was some clarity there. It's almost an experience. Or on the other hand, at the very top, um, it's a completely non-ambiguous experience. Everything is completely clear. You could, you could introspect on that experience in a 100% uh, uh, vivid and clear way. So he ended up with four categories, and argued that that was it was four categories that was the natural and easy amount for subjects to deal with. Now, in terms of the scale, so here no experience is PAS, perceptual level one. We've got two, three, and four. Now, where do you think something from perception lies? So, if people, if you could demonstrate people were discriminating what was there, they're objectively above chance. What would where be the division between um, unconscious perception and, and perception being conscious to some degree? Just talk about that with a person next year. Remember in the, the first lecture we talked about what a mental state is and I said very roughly you can think about it as having certain content and you have a certain, you entertain that content in a, in a certain way. And I think it's always a good idea when you talk about conscious and unconscious mental states is you're clear about what is the content you're talking about. Because when you, when you have a certain, when there's a certain mental state there it has a certain content. So if you're going to say some mental state is conscious say what mental state, what's the content? If you're going to say it's unconscious, you should say what mental state, what's the content that's unconscious? So let's say we're, we're showing circles, squares, diamonds, and so on, 
and uh, interested person in discriminating. And um, well, they give you no experience rating, and they're discriminating by chance. Uh, well, they have, because they can discriminate circle versus square, circle versus square content is there in the central state. But what they're telling you is, I have no experience at all. So that would seem subliminal, right? Does that make sense? They're saying no experience, and that's clearly subliminal. Now, the more controversial one, brief clips. So what the person is saying there is, I've got no idea if it's a circle square triangle. I know it's for something, but that's all I know. So now it's, and let's say they are discriminated by the child. So let's say there is a square there, and they're getting it right. That means there is a perceptual state, first order perceptual state, about there being a square there. As a circle. So there is a state having the content, having content relevant to shape. Now we can ask whether that that state about square is that conscious or unconscious. And now the person will go with higher order thought. Because then the reason why I'm going with higher order thought is sort of easy to ask these questions. It's easy to analyze what's going on. So for that to be conscious, there would need to be a higher order thought that said, I see there is a square there. That's what would make the square content conscious. The, the visual, the, the, the visual um, uh, state of the square there. So by that analysis, does brief glimpse give you something more perception? Yes. Because we can, we can isolate a perceptual state, a first order state with a certain content about squares being there, the square being there. And that state with that content is not conscious because there isn't a higher order thought about seeing the square there. Let's put your hands up if that's clear. Good. <coughs> These are the results uh, he obtained in um, one of these first papers on the perceptual awareness scale. Um, there's only a handful of subjects here, by the way. But you get, a, you get a pretty good relationship between the perceptual awareness scale and objective performance. Which is nice to get, because it indicates uh, when subjects give these introspective reports, they're not just plucking numbers out of the air. It does mean something, because every time the subject says it's getting more vividly clear, they're getting objectively better. So in a way that helps to validate, that's one way you can validate a subjective report when you show it has objective consequences. That's a really general strategy. Now it turns out these are confidence intervals. That's a chance based slide. When the subject said no experience, there were non significant chance. That's a finding over guard often gets, but not always. And we've gotten um, above chance people just show no experience. He universally gets above chance when people give me clips. So by that method of indicating something more perception, that's easy to get. No experience, a bit harder, but you can't take it. Now I just want to present a, a criticism of um, being too wedded to a scale like that for showing subliminal perception. Um, well, you've got the slides, so you probably know what this is. I don't know uh, if anyone hasn't looked at the slides. When um, Perrig and Eckstein showed people block shapes like this, uh, a good proportion of people didn't see what was there. In other words, they didn't see that these were actually words. What they saw was just the block shapes. But as you see in the slides, what they actually are uh, words that have been uh, mirrored below, put together. And when you put them together like that, it looks funny, and um, if you don't know what's going on, you just think, Funny shapes as experimenters show. 
nonetheless, what uh, Peregrine Eckstein found was that were to be presented like this, uh, primed their processing later. So they were processed as words, even though the subject didn't see them as words. And they presented this as an example of something more perception. So maybe if the word, uh, so here we have the word awareness, let's say you didn't see that as the word awareness. You just saw this kind of option. But later when you're given the word awareness, you're faster to respond to it because of the priming of the blockchain. Now, what, uh, so some sort of processing is going on here. Um, I, I put it like this, if one sees X, so you see a block show, uh, and, or you see a word, maybe you see the word there, the word there, the word there, the word there, but you consciously see only a block show, then X is seen unconsciously. Because there's some processing of the word being there. That you don't have a higher order thought of seeing the word there, you have a higher order thought of seeing a bunch of blocks in front of square lines. So the first order state of seeing the word there is an unconscious perceptual state. Now, in terms of the perceptual awareness scale, what weight rating might the subject give for seeing this shape? Well, it might be completely clear. Yes, you see it completely clear. No doubt about what I saw. So everything sharply, clearly, interesting, absolutely fine. So this is an example where you could have a, uh, a completely vivid, clear experience, and yet there's still something more perception. So the real question of subliminal perception is not really the vividness or the clarity of your experience. It's whether there's some first order representation about this content that isn't made conscious. And from a higher order thought perspective, that would be didn't figure in your higher order thoughts about what you saw. From a global workspace perspective, that would be that content wasn't part of the global workspace. And this relates, by the way, to um, your first assignment. Um, one of the things you want to be really clear about is specifying the content of the mental states. Because you're, you're going to be writing about uh, mental state being conscious or unconscious in a, in a recent paper. Make sure you get down what is the content of the mental state you're claiming is conscious or unconscious. And that will help. That will drastically help you think. <coughs> Jacobi introduced the processed association procedure, as I said um, last lecture, originally in memory, but then it's been applied very generally um, to perception, applied to perception, when we get to implicit learning, applied uh, to implicit learning as well. Uh, he argued that it was a, uh, a novel approach to either the subject or the object threshold. So let's go through his argument and then we'll evaluate what is it doing and, and um, how do we relate it to the different theories of consciousness. So in, the, in the experiment, he did look at um, unconscious perception. First of all, there's a fixation <coughs> across your Then a word for half a second, which we could say. Then another word middle and final word of half second. These two words on the outside act as forward and back masks. Now when this middle word here is presented for 500 milliseconds, in other words half a second, it will be almost always seen clearly. Half a second is long enough for you to, almost anyone to see clearly. I mean there's big individual differences in thresholds. When, you, when, you, when you're setting a threshold, like Tony Marcel did, uh, 
uh, he set a threshold individually for each subject. For some subjects, that threshold could be close to 10 milliseconds. For other subjects, it could be over 100 milliseconds. You get huge individual differences in um, the right SOA for a given person to make, make something unconscious. And that should just give you pause when you see a lot of recent studies that don't set individual thresholds. They just have a bang. 30, 40, 50 milliseconds or something, constant for everybody. Some people, that will be clearly visible. For other people, not. So 50 milliseconds, some, some of these words represent 50 milliseconds. That's going to be quite difficult for a lot of people. Now, so these words, these three words flash up, and then a tiger word is given. You know it's a target because there'll be a word stem and um, some blanks the subject has to fill in. <coughs> the exclusion test, complete the stem with a word that comes to mind, but not any you just saw. Remember the exclusion test. So, the word patch, say, the word patch was one of the words. Then in the exclusion test, you would have to complete it as, I don't know, patio, and make sure you don't do patch. If staff was there, then none of these words apply. That gives you a, the, the baseline level of completing this patch. So baseline means none of the words were relevant. We just see how often is the person completed as the title word. Now, for the exclusion task, if patch was there, remember, you've got to make sure it's not patch. That should make you go below baseline if, if, if you're doing the job of excluding. And then the inclusion test, you complete the stem with one of the words flashed, or if not, one of the first word that comes to mind. So, in the exclusion test, your conscious perception would make you not use the word patch. But the argument is your unconscious perception would prime you and make you use the word patch. So in exclusion, the conscious and the unconscious are working in opposition. Remember, that's the logic. In the inclusion test, they're working together because your conscious memory, the conscious perception, would make you complete it as patch because you meant to complete it with the word that you saw. And your unconscious perception would make you complete it as patch. So they're working together in concert. So those are the two conditions. One condition working in concert, one condition working in opposition. Now, on the face of it, this doesn't have much to do with subject and object and thresholds, it's to do with control. Can you control the use of that perception? <coughs> That's the way Jacobi thought about it, because he defined consciousness in terms of control. If you can control the use of the information, it's conscious. However, if you really think about what's being asked, I see this as an interesting way of doing a subject to threshold. Because what you're really being asked is um, to exclude a word if you think you saw it. That's the judgment you really make. So let's say the word patch comes to mind. You have to decide, did you see patch or not? So really, whether you exclude is conditional on whether you have a higher order thought of seeing. If you think you saw patch, you're going to exclude. If a higher order thought of seeing, you're going to exclude. So I don't really buy Jacoby's argument that this is fundamentally different to subject to threshold. Sort of an interesting way um, of uh, looking at subject to thresholds. Or in other words, whether people have relevant viral reports. So now, baseline. Uh, hands up if you understand what baseline means. Then. What's this baseline?
Yes, yeah, so baseline is if you had love, star, flare, now do equal to the <coughs> Patch wasn't there. So, but people have a tendency to complete the patch anyway, even if it wasn't there. That's your baseline. So that's just, as you say, what you do anyway. When there's no prime in one way or the other. Now, if you uh, look at the 500 millisecond, when the middle word was 500 millisecond, let's say patch was 500 milliseconds. When people were asked not to say patch, it's way below baseline, uh, close to zero. And people are told to use what you saw, it's been close to one. So there's a huge difference between inclusion and exclusion. What does that mean on the Jacobin framework? So it's conscious, right? You've got almost perfect control over the use of the information, so it's conscious. You can withhold it when you ask to withhold it, you can give it when you ask to give it. You can do whatever you want with it, it's up to you. That sort of goes with a global workspace type model of consciousness, this notion of control. Because what do you get when something's in the workspace? The ability to flexibly use it according to whatever bit of the brain wants to use it a certain way. Also notice the 500 milliseconds, point one is way below baseline. So people are effectively excluded. They are holding back against <coughs> habits. They can overcome habit. So it's conscious. <coughs> now 50 milliseconds is um, the more interesting. Now, as I said, this is on the sort of uh, intermediate area. For some people, they'll say they didn't see anything. You're doing something to threshold. A threshold to the face. Other people will see anything. Was there some conscious perception? Is there any evidence of conscious perception for the 50 milliseconds? Yes. Yes. Well, was inclusion greater than exclusion? Yes. So, there's some control. Take some control over the use of that information. That Jacobi argues we can say the proportion of trials which they have. We don't have to worry about going through that. You see, there was some control. But so, on at least some of the trials, uh, it was consciously distinct. Was there any unconscious perception? Yeah. And why, why can we argue there was unconscious perception? Yes. Yes, exactly. Exclusion was bigger than baseline. So because exclusion was bigger than baseline, they were primed. So they must have seen. So there was seeing. But was it conscious seeing? But well, if you consciously saw, you would be what? Below baseline. But it's above baseline. So the argument is kind of being conscious seeing. So it was seeing, but not conscious seeing. So it was unconscious seeing. <coughs> so I... Um, I argue this is sort of a fancy subjective threshold. I do, I do think it's a really neat um, paradigm, though. I don't want to uh, dismiss it by saying that. Because what we've got here is the demonstration of, of both, simultaneously we can say, there was some conscious perception going on, and there was some unconscious perception going on. Whereas what a lot of people have argued with, with the old threshold setting phase is, if you've got any evidence for conscious perception in the threshold setting phase, you say the whole experiment is um, invalid. There's some conscious perception going on, uh, therefore we can't trust you've shown something of perception. Here we can say, yeah, it's so difficult to get no conscious perception. We don't have to bother trying to get no conscious perception. We can show you there was a mixture. And that will be typical for most conditions. Yeah, bit of conscious, bit of So 
So process association procedure is um, a neat procedure, I think. Um, but you can look at it two ways. You can look at it either the Jacobi way, as uh, um, thinking about consciousness as defined by your ability to flexibly control your knowledge. And that would fit with a global workspace type theory. Or in the context of this particular paradigm, the way it's set up here, we can think of it in terms of higher order thought theory and say, well, actually, control is based on whether you have a higher order thought. So really, it's another way of uh, measuring higher order thoughts in the context of this particular usage. Now, so far, I've argued for subliminal perception, at least it's defined a certain way with respect to a subject to threshold or, or equivalent as, as something that's real. Um, but it might seem a bit artificial. Um, maybe it could be used in some practical context when you go on to consider, consider that, like advertising and, and so on. But in everyday life, you don't get back masking, forward masks, and that sort of thing. So is subliminal perception just some curiosity you find in the lab? Or is it something that might apply in everyday life? So I think the answer to that is um, this next method of showing subliminal perception, uh, perception, which is inattentional blindness. And that's the idea that information can be below, be below a subject to threshold. Just because you're attending to one thing, and the stuff that's happening is um, outside your focus of attention. <coughs> so Mac and Rock had a classic demonstration of this. This is a really nice experiment for subject to do if you're doing a study swap because it involves just three trials, and that's the end of the experiment. So once you've done that, the subject's really you can't use them again. What the subject had to do was to look at a, uh, well, look at a fixation cross, but attend to this cross here and make a difficult decision as to whether the horizontal arm or the vertical arm is the long way. While, while they do that for two trials, in the third trial, the word appears. For, say, 200 milliseconds. And that's it. And then um, you ask subjects, did they see a word? 60% of subjects are, no, I didn't see a word there in that third trial. Of course, once you've alerted to them that you're going to flash words, you can't do it again. That's why they become excused at, uh, at this point. But you can show that they did process the word, because of these so called blind subjects, 36% completed the word stem with the presented word, where the baseline was 4%. So, um, if you accept, accept that claim, that means um, if you're walking around and attending to one thing, you can still be processing, say, what's on the billboard, what's happening in the party over here, and that could be influencing you without you being aware that you saw or received. So then that made the perception a lot more interesting in terms of something that could be affecting us in everyday life, maybe a lot of the time. Now the other practical concern people have with some perceptions with advertising. Now, there was a claim by Vickery, James Vickery set up an advertising company that by flashing uh, eat popcorn at the cinema or drink Coca-Cola, he could dramatically increase the sales in the road time of his products. And those claims led to something like advertising being banned. Uh, but it turned out he made it all up. Um, he was just trying to, he's just a businessman trying to push his company. It took a long time, so uh, there's obviously an in a practically interesting question. This is the first real study I found, since then there's been a few studies following this up, to say, well, could you really influence people 
to consume more of a product by by flash and brand name or something. Like that. It's not obvious that you could. For example, in the sort of experiments we're talking about, like Stroop effects and so on, it might be that the subliminal effects just last a few seconds at most and disappear. Well, there's no reason to think that would guide you to buy certain brands if you already had your own opinion, say, of what you wanted and what you liked. So it's a non-obvious question. And uh, this group looked at it. First of all, they had a uh, priming phase um, where subjects looked at the screen doing some, uh, some task. Um, which I can't remember what it is now that it works or something. Uh, can't quite remember. Anyway, what was buried in between a forward mask and a backward mask was the word lip device for 23 milliseconds. A fixed amount of time for everybody. The end of that block, this this uh, separate group of subjects were asked to guess what was flashed. Say, so what word was flashed in between the X's? And none of them guessed. So that was uh, a sort of to show. That was a phase to show that, or an attempt to show that under these conditions, the stimulus is presented subliminally. Now, what sort of threshold has been set there? Is that objective or subjective? Yeah, subjective. Because we're not looking at the ability of the person to discriminate what was there. You're just saying, what did you see? Now, you could also ask, is it a particularly rigorous subjective threshold? If you say, guess what was flashed. I'd say not really. I mean, let's say the person um, had some idea about what was flashed, but didn't want to be wrong about it, or just wanted to be it's the same ideas I went through in the in the Marcel case. You might not want to say something until you're reasonably sure about what you saw. So you might say, oh, "No, I don't know what it was." So there certainly would be better ways of going about this. And in some ways, it's this sort of thing that gives a subject a threshold a bad name because this is easy to criticise. But that doesn't mean subject to threshold are bad. That just means there's more and there's rigorous ways of doing subject to thresholds. And if you really want to know whether a person had a trial by trial, higher order thought of seeing something, you need to test that in a sensitive way. But in any case, um, so we could we could certainly investigate the subject to threshold more sensitively than they did here. But I guess you could look at it as a um, it's still an interesting practical question that under conditions in which a person isn't prepared to say they saw something, can we still see if they were nonetheless influenced by it? And that's a sort of a maybe a, a practical definition of subliminal perception, even if it's not a completely rigorous one, that would convince a, a skeptic as it were. So then, uh, with another group of subjects, the, uh, either flash, lip to nice, or a rearrangement of those letters as a control group. They're asked how thirsty they are, and then they're offered a range of drinks. So this is a Dutch study, so these are Dutch brands. This is the finding. For the people who said they're thirsty, I mean, this is a massive effect. This, this is, uh, Really started the way. Uh, more than 80% of people chose lifting, uh, chose lift an ice cream, compared to 20% of people in the control, control condition. So if you got the lift and ice prime, you're much more likely to choose lift and ice. And the, the effect is uh, considerably reduced if you weren't thirsty. So the, the claim of the authors was um, that as long as you're in the right motivational state to be affected, say you're thirsty, for example, when it comes to a subliminal uh, drink prime, then you can be affected, even in conditions under which you're not prepared to say that you saw something. So this does open the possibility of subliminal priming, uh, at least defined in a loose sense, uh, of being quite relevant to advertising. And maybe the banning of it wasn't 
too premature, even though it was based on a hoax and a fraud. Now, this study has been followed up in several papers, and so you might want to chase up whether the threshold setting phase has been done in more rigorous ways, uh, and so whether you could get something more priming when you were more happy that there was actually no conscious experience. So my conclusion from those two last two studies is not only does subliminal perception exist, at least in, in some sense, but it can be practically relevant. It's something we, we need to consider both in everyday lives and by possible manipulation by other people. So we're going to finish uh, here today and um, consider, uh, I suppose, more theoretical. Having established there is some sense in which subliminal perception exists, we'll consider next lecture a bit more. Is that theoretically interesting from the point of view of psychology, of neuroscience? Uh, what's going on? <coughs> so before you go,